Happy Easter, everybody. It's so exciting to know that we are together worshiping as a church with people both here in Portland and around the world as we celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. And today we are going to talk about one big idea, and here it is. He has overcome. I want to read you a scripture that we began studying last week from John chapter 16, 33. And these were spoken by Jesus himself on the very last night before he would give his life for you and me. Here's what Jesus said. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart because I've overcome the world. And when it comes down to how we live in this life, the joy we have, the satisfaction we experience, even the power we have as individual believers, it really comes down to whether or not we believe what Jesus said in this last statement, I have overcome the world. These are powerful words, but when you need them, these are words of life and death. And when it comes to life, I really wonder, when does it feel like your life really began? I got to perform a wedding this weekend for a couple that I love so much and I just smiled the whole time. I smiled the whole way home because I know in so many ways a wedding means that a new life has begun. But when did your life begin? When did you start the trajectory that you're on today? Some people say it was their first job. Maybe it was college. Maybe it was back in high school. I recently had the chance to go back to my old high school and I was flooded with a million memories, both good and bad. Um, It was crazy. Those were times when my best friend's name was Joey, when my job was in the drive-through at the local Chick-fil-A. I was interested in journalism, acting, and I did yearbook. I mainly did yearbook to get out of school early. And I had a really big crush on a girl named Jenny Melton. It's okay, I wouldn't meet Andrea until college. So Jenny was this incredible person. Everybody loved her. She had uh, dark brown hair, brown eyes, and of course she was Italian. So any chance I got to visit her family's house, I always had a big bowl of something delicious. Jenny had a smile that always lit up the room. In fact, I got my first cell phone in, in high school, which seems so quaint now, and Jenny was the first girl that I would stay up late like texting, like LOL, all kinds of messages too. And we would talk on the phone for hours at night, and at the time I didn't know what to call it, but it was definitely a crush. I just couldn't stop thinking about her. Uh, Jenny's parents owned a convenience store near the lake, and we would just go there as friend group and hang out for hours. And if we were lucky, we would get a free Snickers. It was awesome. And in the fall of our senior year, Jenny was named homecoming queen in front of thousands of people because even though she was cool and pretty, she was so down to earth and approachable. Jenny and I were voted for high school senior superlatives our last year in high school, and we got to be in the yearbook together, which at the time I thought, man, I'm so lucky that I get to take this picture with Jenny for the world to see. So cheesy. We couldn't wait for graduation. And one morning in March, I was at the college campus because I was taking about half of my classes there. And I was away from my phone for about 30 minutes. And I remember walking back and picking it up. And for the first time ever, my phone had literally blown up. I had missed like dozens of phone calls and text messages. And rather than sort of like clicking through the list, I just immediately hit call to the first number, and it was my home. And for whatever reason, my grandmother was there babysitting my brothers, and she picked up, and there was something different in her voice. And she said, Aaron, I have to tell you something. And I said, what is it? And she said, you know your friend Jenny? I said, yes. She said, well, on the way to school this morning, she had a terrible car accident, and Aaron, she passed away. And I just look back to that moment knowing that in a second what it feels like to have your world change because to that moment i'd never really lost anyone close to me like that i was in shock i knew conceptually that death was real but i never considered that it could be personal i think in that moment my faith changed forever and i had to decide what so many of us have had to decide along this journey of life Am I really going to believe all of this stuff in a world that's filled with pointless tragedy? What would Jesus even say about a moment like this, about the death of a girl with such a bright future and such a bright life and every reason to live? I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. 
I've overcome the world. In that moment, I had to make a decision that thousands and millions and billions of people have made. That when faced with the reality of life and the words of Jesus, am I going to believe that these are just easy words for difficult times? Or does Jesus really offer something more? I think the answer will all depend on what happens next in this story. See, today is Resurrection Sunday. Happy Easter. We're so excited to celebrate. And around the world, Christians are celebrating a day. But the truth of the matter is, is we're celebrating a day that some people really don't even believe in. In fact, many people who would call themselves Christians don't even truly believe in the reason we're celebrating today. And I think that according to science and scripture, that what you believe about the resurrection of Jesus changes everything else about you. So let's look one more time at this audacious claim that Jesus would speak into a broken and hurting world. He would say, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And I think our big idea is simply this, that we will always be overwhelmed unless we truly believe that Jesus has overcome. History tells us that by every account, Jesus was indeed extraordinary. No matter what you believe about miracles and life and death, History tells us again and again that Jesus existed, that he ruffled feathers, and that he changed the world. I was reading a biblical archaeology review article from a professor at Purdue University, and here's what he writes. He said, Jewish rabbis who did not like Jesus or his followers accused Jesus of being a magician and leading people astray, but they never said he didn't exist. And that's why we're still talking about this Jesus thousands of years later. It's why his name comes up in conversations. It's why people take his name in praise and take his name in vain. It's because Jesus changed the world. The Jewish rabbis believed he was a magician. So let's take a quick look at this magic. What kind of power did Jesus have? He had the power to overcome. We see in Matthew 8 that Jesus had the power to overcome leprosy. This is an incredible story, so much so I want to read it to you. In Matthew 8, verse 1, it says this, When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him. By the way, I don't think we've ever understood in modern culture what it was like to come in contact with something that looked like a plague. I have always flown for the past, I don't know, 20 years on airplanes. It's been a regular part of my life. And in the past year, that experience has changed dramatically. I never thought twice about wiping down the tray in front of me or avoiding people or scanning the room to see if anybody had what looked like a running nose or a cough. And if you see somebody in this day and age that looks like they could be contagious, you have one response and that is to get away. Well, in the day and age of Jesus, there was a disease, and it wasn't just a physical disease. It was a social disease called leprosy. In fact, there was religious stigma attached to this disease and cultural stigma attached to this disease. And so when we look back and said that in the midst of a crowd, a man with leprosy came forward, you might expect that there would be gasping, that there would be a feeling of uncomfortableness, and there would certainly be the stigma of scandal. And this man had the audacity to walk up to Jesus and say, Lord, if you are willing. And I think just like the leper, so many of us have to make the decision. Do we believe that Jesus, first of all, is able to help us? The second question we have to ask is, is Jesus willing to help us? So here we have this needy man in such a moment of vulnerability, and Jesus could have rebuked him and thrown him away like so many people expect for religious people to do. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately, The man was cleansed of his leprosy. I've been struck before that Jesus, he, the Bible says, created the world with a word. Just by speaking, be healed, Jesus could have changed this man's life. But the physical disease masked a deeper problem, and that was a social stigma. 
And in this one moment, in this one touch, Jesus was willing and able to overcome. Not only did Jesus overcome leprosy, we see that Jesus overcame social stigma. In John chapter 4, Jesus crossed cultural and gender boundaries to have a conversation with a woman of a scandalous cultural background, according to his Jewish friends. And he sat down and he spoke with this woman and told her that if she was willing, if she believed, he would give her a spring of life in her heart that would never run dry. And this lady would go on to tell everybody about her experience with Jesus. We see that Jesus had the power and ability to overcome blindness. In John chapter 9, again, we see a man with social, spiritual stigma that Jesus approached, and the man left healed. And we see that this was in the fulfillment of prophecy that says Jesus came to set the captives free. Jesus came to give sight to the blind because Jesus never just came to be a good example. By his own statement and deeds, Jesus came to overcome Jesus also overcame sexist bigotry. In the book of John, we see a story about a woman who was caught in the act of adultery and why the man, while the man got to go free, this lady was cast before Jesus and the religious people of the day demanded her death. And months later, they would be demanding the very death of the one who can save. Jesus looked at this lady and famously asked her, after basically saying, if anyone else has no sin, then let them cast the first stone, cleared things out quickly. Jesus looked at this woman and said, where are those who condemn you? And she looks around and says, there's no one here. And he says, then I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Jesus was overcoming left and right. And maybe one of my favorite stories is how Jesus could overcome toxic religious culture. It's so ironic that so many people fall away from Jesus or run away from Jesus or ignore Jesus because of toxic religious culture, because we see that this is something that he would confront and condemn and overcome again and again. Let me read you a story in Mark chapter 2, verse 16. It says, And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with these collectors and sinners? In verse 17, When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are quote-unquote well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Man, this is a Jesus who can overcome in this moment, Jesus declared that if you have ever been imperfect, if you've ever had someone make you feel like they let you down, if you've ever felt like you're not good enough, if you've ever been rejected by people who are in power, then Jesus wants you to know through the ages and in this moment that you are exactly the reason that he came. This ravishing love of God in this moment is lighting up the Savior's eyes. And these are the eyes that are looking to you. You see, I believe in this life you will always be overwhelmed until you believe that Jesus has overcome. John 16, 33, this magic man, this overcomer, this rebuker of religious bigotry, this Savior says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. He said this to a group of friends in an upper room over dinner. These are the men who have seen Jesus overcome, overcome blindness, bigotry, sickness, and religious evil, and yet something was still missing. The question hung in the air. This man could he overcome the greatest obstacle of all? Could he overcome the grave? You see, this is a story of life and death. These men were close friends with Jesus. They were his inner circle. They had seen on numerous occasions, two in particular, about how Jesus took a simple spread of fish and loaves and somehow fed thousands of people. They had seen Jesus calm tempestuous, life-threatening storms with a single word. Without the intervention of Jesus, uh, there's a great threat that they could have died, and yet he saved them. These are the same people that watched Jesus walk out on water and then invite one of them to leave the boat and to join him. 
Yet, in just a few hours, they would all go together to a peaceful, prayerful garden. And when Jesus asked them in his deepest time of distress to stay awake and pray with him, they would fall asleep. And Jesus wept in the garden that night because he knew what was coming. He knew that one of those 12 friends were going to betray him. The story of Judas reminds us that we should never be fooled by someone's outward affection for Jesus or even their cultural proximity to Jesus. The story of Judas reminds us that lots of people claim to love Jesus, not because of who he is, but perhaps because of how knowing Jesus can further their goals. And the story of Judas reminds us that the Judases of the world always seem to profit most off of their connection to Christ. Many of us have turned away, not because of the story of Jesus, but because of the story of an unnamed Judas. A man named Pilate would go on to ask Jesus about why he was being condemned to death. After his betrayal, Jesus would be captured and shackled and drugged into several kangaroo court sessions and eventually would end up before the ruler of the land, the governor named Pilate. And Pilate had all the power to condemn Jesus. He had every reason to expedite this moment. And history and scripture records a conversation between these two men. It's really fascinating. One question that Pilate really wanted to get the answer of is, hey Jesus, do you really claim to be the king? You see, that's an uncomfortable question because so many people are willing to receive Jesus as savior. But the reason people get angry with Jesus is when he reminds them that he came to be a king. He came to be the king. Pilate asks, are you really a king? And in John 18, 36, we have Jesus' response. Here's what he says. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. And then Pilate asked him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king, and for this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked him an audacious question, what is truth? After he said this to him, he went back outside, and Pilate told the Jews, I find no guilt in him. We see a lot of examples of the story of Judas in the world, but I think we see a lot of examples of the story of Pilate in our world. I think that many people agree with Pilate's declaration. I find no guilt with Jesus. I've heard people say again and again, Jesus is a really good guy. I can't find a flaw with him. I really, really like Jesus. I'm a really, really big fan of Jesus. And yet they're also stuck on the question that Pilate couldn't get over. What is truth? Your answer to that question will determine everything about you. I wonder where are you today? Is Jesus really good? Or is Jesus really God? It all depends on the question, did he overcome the grave? Dr. Gary Habermas is a researcher and a historian who studies the resurrection. He has a great story. He's a former skeptic who came to faith. He's the author of lots of books and countless scholarly articles, and his focus is on the academic circles where historians and theologians and archaeologists are having the question on the historicity of Jesus. In fact, Gary Habermas is the author of The Verdict of History, and I would love for you to hear just a brief moment of how Gary describes his interaction with common scholars regarding this issue. Critics, the, the consensus position is that you can track the resurrection preaching back to immediately after the cross. In fact, the way it's often stated by, say, Bart Ehrman, is that when Paul said yes to Jesus on the way to, to Damascus, there was already a body of data called the early creeds that are later written in the New Testament, but they were already being noised abroad. When Paul said yes, there were these heavy creeds, about 80% of which are in the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus, because that's a major message. They were already in existence. So when Paul, Paul didn't invent Christianity, the main reason, 
When he came to Christ, the message he hated most, we already have data from that, that two-year period. There is. I did an article uh, some years ago where I argued that less than 25% of the critics in the last 25 years, about less than 25% use the naturalistic theories anymore. They, they will usually say something like this. Um, yeah, facts are good. I don't agree. It's your, your idea is the only way to go. But, you know, you've got an evidence case. And, and if you pushed them a little bit and said, well, what keeps you from believing this stuff yourself? If the Can I guess? Are good. Go ahead. Hume. Well, Hume, but I think generally they'll say, I just don't want to, I just don't want to believe. I've talked to a lot of people over the last 15 years in ministry, and on the subject of Jesus, I found something that recurs again and again. This is just my experience. I found that some people don't believe in Jesus because they really just don't want to believe. There's something in their past, there's something in their present, there's something in their mind. They just can't get over it and they just don't want to believe in Jesus. And I've talked to some people who don't believe, and it's because they're just not ready to believe yet. It was the same with Jesus' disciples. In this stunning record of Jesus' life, this person who claimed to be God, we have some really honest details. Some might ask, why, if you were trying to start a religion based on the life of this guy, why would you include some of these really embarrassing stories? And one of the most humiliating things that Jesus had to endure is that during his darkest hour, his closest friends acted like they never believed in him. Jesus told them, in this world you will have trouble. Maybe they didn't know that hours later that would include the fact that Jesus would be flogged, that he would be spat upon, that he would endure a crown of thorns. A few years ago, I had the privilege of taking a trip to Israel. I actually got to stand on the floor where Jesus was whipped, looking at the place where his blood might have spilt. I got to walk on a road, a historical place called the Via Dolorosa, and it's the traditional journey believed that Jesus took on the way to the cross. And as I'm walking down this road, I'm just thinking about how cramped it is. Like on either side, they're building some two and three stories high. And the Bible would tell us that people were jeering and yelling at him and hanging outside of windows. And just walking down that road on a normal day, it felt almost claustrophobic. And I can't even imagine what it would feel like when you have been betrayed and bleeding as you're making your way, carrying your own cross. This king of kings, this one who overcame leprosy and bigotry and sexism and disease, this one who came with love was now being showered with hate. Those crowds that a week earlier were cheering were now taunting. In Israel, I actually got to visit the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. It's the place where the cross of Jesus was raised. It's where he was nailed, naked, in excruciating pain. And yet, we still have records in the Gospels that while Jesus was on the cross, he was thinking of others. Somehow he could overcome his pain to think of the ones he came to save. In John 19, 25, Jesus looks down on the ones that are grieving him. This is what the Bible says, by standing, but standing by the cross of Jesus where his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, we only have record of one, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. This is someone who was so good that he was concerned about the well-being of his mom while he was being tortured to death. Sure, we can say that Jesus was good, but was he God? There's another incredible thing that we see in the historical record in the life of Jesus. The complete shame and betrayal of the disciples on the night of his death. And yet, we have reliable historical record that says the same ones who scattered would then later go on to give everything for Jesus. They would be judged like he was judged. They would be beaten like he was beaten. They would ignite a worldwide century-spanning movement that reaches into this 
room today and many of them would lose their life like Jesus lost their life. Those who were once cowards became courageous ambassadors of this good news, this gospel hope. And so our question has to be today, what did they see that changed everything? What they saw is the reason we celebrate Easter. This beautiful story about how Mary, his close friend, the one who watched him as he hung on the cross, would go to bring herbs and spices to his grave three days after his death. And what she would find was stunning. She would find the stone rolled away. She would find an empty tomb. We see later that Jesus himself would meet with his friend Peter, the one who betrayed him the night of his death three times. And with love and hope and forgiveness and life, we see that Jesus restored Peter. And yet in the Bible, we still see that there were people who had doubts because they were too overwhelmed to believe that Jesus had overcome. A man named Thomas, he heard the stories Jesus was appearing to people. Could it be true? The one who walked on water, the one who healed the sick, the one who gave sight to the blind has conquered the grave. Is this real? And Thomas said what so many of us have said sometime in our life. He said, I will believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I can touch the wound in his hand, when I can touch the wounds on his side. And the Bible records this stunning moment in John chapter 20, verse 26. It says, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Whoa, here's what he said. Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. And something changed. See, Thomas always believed that Jesus was good. In this moment, he believed Jesus was God. It changed everything. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And I want you to know something personal today. In that moment, Jesus is talking about you. Jesus is talking about those who would hear the truth of this story. They would find the presence of Christ. They would believe that Jesus didn't come just to offer solutions. They would find that Jesus has come to give real salvation. And Jesus said there is a blessing for those who believe. In that statement, Jesus is talking about you. And what I want you to know this Easter is this, is that you will always be overwhelmed until you believe that Jesus has overcome. The ripple effects of this moment, the resurrection from the dead, the empty tomb, the testimony of life, and the promise that Jesus is coming again, that is the very foundation for this worldwide life-giving, life-affirming change called the gospel. 1 Peter 1.3, the one who betrayed Jesus would go on to write this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because according to his great mercy, he's called us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Paul would write in 1 Thessalonians 4.14, This guy, Paul, once was murdering people for believing in Jesus, but encountered the risen Jesus in a divine vision, changed his life. And here's what he writes. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Romans 8.11 says this, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And then John 11.25 and 26, here's the great promise. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they may die, 
they shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks the question that hangs in the air today for you and for me. Jesus said, do you believe this? Belief in the resurrection changed the world. Christians, at the very heart of it, this is all that we are. We are nothing more and we are nothing less than the people who believe that God himself has conquered the grave. And the question we must keep reminding ourselves is if that Jesus overcame death, is there anything he cannot overcome? The answer is no. If he can conquer the grave, he can conquer our fear. If he can conquer the grave, he can conquer our doubt. If he can conquer the grave, he can overcome the situations and the trouble and the tribulation this life keeps throwing at us, no matter where we're from, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been. Jesus Christ is enough. And because of that, we celebrate. Because of that, we worship him. He is worthy of our love. He is worthy of our worship. And he is worthy of our lives. These are not just pretty words that are easy to bring out in hard times. This is a stunning, eternal, world-shaping promise. When Jesus said, I've said these things to you, that in me, you may have peace. Because in this world, you will have trouble. Somebody said amen. In this world, you will have trouble, even if you're good. In this world, you will have trouble, even if you cling to the Lord. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. I told you earlier about my friend Jenny and about how her life and death made me realize death isn't just real, it gets personal. And this has been a year when we've always realized that tragedy was real, but we're realizing tragedy is personal. Jenny died in the spring, and the year before she died on one of our conversations, she had called me up, and I'll never forget it. I was sitting in the parking lot of my church I was just leaving youth group. She wasn't with me, but she called me up and she said, Aaron, I want you to know something. She said, I just did something incredible and I'll never be the same. She said, I've given my life to Jesus and I know I've been saved. As I sat at Jenny's memorial service two days after before her tragic death, I had what could only be described as a peace that passes understanding. And I remember looking ahead at the flowers and the pictures and the cathedral that we were sitting in. And I knew I wasn't looking at the reality of death. No, I was looking at the promise of everlasting life. You will always be overwhelmed until you believe that Jesus has overcome. I have two simple invitations. If you're a person who's never gone all in with Jesus, my invitation is really simple. Consider belief. The story of Jesus shows that he was really comfortable around people who most religious people threw away. That Jesus reached out to people that most of the world had forgotten. And that he was also really okay with the questions of skeptics. In fact, those who are willing to ask the question usually brought Jesus near. And today, I just want you to know it's okay if you want to look at the history. I believe the history is solid. It's okay if you want to look at the story. I believe the story is so good. But most importantly, I want you to know today, consider Jesus, because the hope he offers is incredible. And it's for you. It's for you. Maybe today you're a believer. And here's my second invitation. If you say you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, Friend, it's time to act like it. This is a time like no other when the people who call themselves by the name of Jesus have turned to every other power than his. If you say you believe in Jesus, it's time to act like it. In every decision, with every choice, with every breath, worship Jesus and follow Jesus. Rejoice and spread the news. 
If you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, there is no area of your life that his power can't overcome. Where do you need him today? What he's left behind is an empty tomb. What he's left behind is an open door to life, abundance, salvation, and fullness. Come to Jesus. As Jesus reminds us, we don't just serve an interesting historical figure. We serve an overcoming king. And his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is coming and has now come. And we celebrate on this day of resurrection because our king is here and our king has overcome. I'll leave you with this. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Be blessed. Mm -hmm.